Welcome to Keon's Lab, and the video you're about to watch is one I've been planning for a very long time. So I was trying to hold off on making this video for as long as possible, because I was going to wait until we had about a thousand subscribers before I made this video, but there was a video released by Tom Stanton yesterday, and after I saw the first couple of minutes of it, of course, I don't watch the entire thing to keep my videos original, but after seeing the basic topic that it was about, I immediately dropped my other script that I was writing, and got to writing the script for the video that you are watching right now. And the reason what I saw in the first two minutes of Tom's video made me absolutely drop everything and get to writing the script that you're watching now is because I did not think it would happen this fast. Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the propagation and adoption of lithium ion and lithium ion hybrid supercapacitors, more specifically the newer ones, into consumer electronics and niche applications that do not require either very large batteries or two are frequently recharged devices that do not need to run for a very long time but have a very high power consumption. With a very good example being the product actually showcased in Tom's video which was a small styrofoam toy plane using a relatively small lithium hybrid supercapacitor about 100 farads and 3 volts on board for powering the small brush DC motor for powering the propeller. This same concept would apply for anything as tiny as a laser pointer like this to something needing a little bit more power like a PlayStation 3 controller like this, or going all the way to the other side of the spectrum on high power, low duration uses, being a jet turbine fan powered hand dryer. So why is it that I keep calling them lithium hybrid supercapacitors and not just lithium supercapacitors? Well, it's actually not for no reason. It's actually the entire reason I'm making this video in the first place. And that's because according to a textbook on lithium ion supercapacitors I've been reading over the past couple of months or so, Tom may have made a slight error when explaining how these supercapacitors work, something which would not entirely be his fault as the devices do have the word capacitor in their name. For example, with the ones I have here, you can clearly see the word supercapacitors, so it would not be entirely the fault of someone for assuming that these are using the same principle as electrolytic capacitors. With the actual chemistry of this new generation of lithium ion hybrid supercapacitors being closer to that of a standard lithium ion battery than that of an electrolytic capacitor, which will be the entire topic of this first video on lithium ion hybrid supercapacitors. So the point I'm referring to in Tom's video is about 4 minutes and 30 seconds, where he explains that the rapid charge and discharge rate is due to the charge being stored between two parallel plates, which while technically true if looking at the physical construction of the cells alone is not entirely accurate when put into the context of how capacitors, supercapacitors, and batteries work. And more specifically, lithium ion supercapacitors and lithium ion rechargeable batteries. As this is a partially incorrect assumption that I myself made when trying to learn about these lithium supercapacitors, which again is not really helped by the fact that they have the word capacitor in their name. Again, with the actual chemistry of the new generation of lithium ion hybrid supercapacitors being closer to that of a lithium ion battery than that of a electrolytic capacitor. Where lithium ion hybrid supercapacitors, just like their close relative, the lithium ion battery, are comprised of what are known as half cells. And not only that, but which also undergo many of the same types of chemical reactions present in lithium ion batteries, known as reduction oxidation reactions, also known as redox, which is a series of chemical reactions not only specific to lithium ion cells, but which are actually present in most rechargeable battery types, including nickel metal hydride, lead acid, nickel cadmium, among many, many others. But more specifically for the lithium ion technology that we're talking about today, this also includes chemical reactions and processes which we will learn about later in this video, known as the intercalation and deintercalation of lithium ions, which is just a very fancy way of saying the lithium ions migrating in and out of the battery half cells during charge and discharge. In addition to various other chemical processes and reactions, the complexity of which would exceed the scope of this video. Paraphrasing the textbook itself where they actually explain that the construction of a lithium hybrid supercapacitor is very similar to that of an electronic double layer capacitor, also known as a EDLC, with one of the only main differences being that one or more of the electrode materials have been replaced by that of the same type or very similar type that would be present in a standard lithium ion battery. Something which is a very, very piece of crucial information if we wish to understand where these super high charge and discharge rates of these lithium hybrid supercapacitors come from as compared to the standard lithium ion battery type. Since as we will learn later in this video, these supercapacitors can actually support charge rates or discharge rates 
up to, or in some cases, over 100C, which again, if you do not know what that means right now, we will learn about that later in the video. As we begin to unravel the mysteries behind this brand new type of lithium ion supercapacitor technology. So taking a look at this very useful image um, taken from the Wikipedia page for pseudo capacitors, we can begin to see that the topic of supercapacitors is a little bit more complicated than it may seem on the surface. As they can be broken down into three different categories based on how they store their charge. And before continuing, I'm just going to specify the source of this image. Because while it was taken from Wikipedia, it does say that the source is the own work of the person who posted it, who goes by the name of ELCAP, LCAP, on Wikipedia. And this image was posted on the 6th of July, 2012. Going off of the Wikipedia page here, again on the pseudocapacitance, where they are defined as storing electrical energy phoretically, which means that electrical energy is being stored through a redox reaction. Similar to, but not exactly the same as a battery, a rechargeable battery that is. Open quote, pseudocapacitors store electrical energy phoretically by electron charge transfer between electrode and electrolyte. This is accomplished through electrosorption, reduction oxidation reactions, also known as redox reactions, and intercalation processes, comma, termed pseudocapacitance, end quote. Where again, referring to the image on the article, it can be seen that the term supercapacitors can be referring to three different things. One of which being the hybrid capacitor is a combination of the two preceding ones. And this is where I believe Tom may have made the little slight error. Just going off of the fact that I believe most of his videos had to do with the EDLC type of supercapacitor rather than the lithium type of supercapacitor, as the lithium type does seem to be new to even people familiar in this field. I remember asking an electronics lab professor um, about the lithium capacitors, and this was about last year, so 2022, and he had absolutely no idea what I was referring to. He knew exactly what EDLCs were, and he would tell me about these gigafarad-sized um, capacitor banks that they would have on trams or something. I don't know how true that is, but as far as I remember, what he told me was that they had these gigafarad-sized pseudo capacitor or super capacitor banks on trams or something. I don't know exactly what he was referring to, but apparently they would be enough to carry a specific type of vehicle or something when it ran out of power lines to connect to. Again, I have not verified this. This is just going off of what I heard. But apparently in an EDLC or electronic double layer capacitor, the electrical energy, like Tom was saying, is stored electrostatically, essentially between the two plates that he was referring to. So taking a look at that image again, now that we have gone over the definition for faradic versus electronic double layer pseudocapacitance, where double layer capacitors are defined as being able to store their charge using electrostatic means only. Whereas a pseudocapacitor uses faradic electrochemical energy storage. And as we went over before, very briefly, faradic electrochemical storage refers to using a reduction oxidation reaction, also known as redox, which then brings us to the third item on the list or in the image, which is hybrid capacitors, where both electrostatic and electrochemical storage methods are used to store the electric charge. Now, it is at this point where I cannot say with certainty whether these supercapacitors, these lithium ion hybrid supercapacitors, fall under the pseudocapacitor or hybrid pseudocapacitor category. However, based on the illustrations and details present in the textbook I was reading, as mentioned before, I am pretty sure that these are hybrid supercapacitors. As in the book, they had divided supercapacitors into three different generations, with generation one being defined as electronic double layer capacitors, again, also known as EDLC, as we can see on here. Second generation lithium ion capacitors, which they called LIC for short, which we can also see on the product code on this lithium ion hybrid or lithium ion supercapacitor. Again, at the moment, I cannot say for certainty which one this is. But with LIC or lithium ion capacitor being defined as generation two, with the main difference being that an electronic double layer capacitor functions much more similar to a standard electrolytic capacitor, where your anode and your cathode are made of graphite or carbon. In the case of the illustration in the book, it is activated carbon, 
with your anions and cations, typically of your electrolyte solution, migrating to their respective electrodes upon charging and discharging. So again, that was only for the case of EDLC or electronic double layer capacitor, defined as generation one in the book. With generation two, where they called it LIC or lithium ion capacitor for short, consists of a graphite anode, an activated carbon cathode, and a lithium ion containing electrolyte solution where lithium ions intercalate and deintercalate in and out of the crystal structure of the graphite particles and the activated carbon particles, depending on whether you're charging or discharging. A process which is very, very closely mirroring that of standard lithium ion batteries. Also being mentioned in this excellent article from the Wiley Online Library titled Definitions of Pseudocapacitive Materials where we can see on the last sentence that the terms pseudocapacitive materials and battery materials are becoming more and more confusing, where pseudocapacitive materials can apply to the lithium capacitors we're covering in this video. With the third illustration in the book being defined as generation three supercapacitors, or rather lithium ion supercapacitors. And it's at this point where I begin to suspect just based on the product codes alone on these capacitors, one of them being called LIC and the other one being called LIB that these newer style of supercapacitors, which were released in 2021, are of the generation three type. And this is just a little sticker I put here to indicate which one is new and which one I have tested once. With generation three being called nano hybrid supercapacitors, where the anode is comprised of lithium metal oxides with the example being given as lithium titanium oxide and carbon nanotubes. Again, this may not be the case with every single one of these types of capacitors. I'm just going off of the illustration. And again, given the strict division of the supercapacitors and specifically the lithium supercapacitors into the three generations, it has inclined me to believe that just simply looking at the difference in capacities between these two almost identically sized supercapacitors, so 750 farad and 1100 farad, 3.8 volt and 4 volt, I am making the educated guess that these LIC types are of generation two and that these LIB types are of generation three, which would also make sense why they use the LIB, which stands for battery, as generation three is much, much, much closer in its physical construction in terms of the materials used to a lithium ion battery than that of an EDLC. So it is at this point that I think it's important to get a brief understanding of how your standard lithium ion batteries work. And also to return to the topic of the separator and how it may potentially affect the charge and discharge rates of these supercapacitors. And of course, another very major factor which would play a part in the charge and discharge rates would be the anode and cathode materials, as well as the electrolyte. I am mainly going to be focusing on the separator in this video. So here I have drawn a two dimensional representation of the inside of a lithium ion battery. And because this side on the anode is actually graphite or activated carbon, I should have technically drew these as like hexagons or like semi-hexagons. I was sort of drawing this in a bad position, so I didn't think it would turn out too well. So I just drew a grid. But I think this should both not only explain on a surface level what intercalation and deintercalation of lithium ions means, but also going into why I think the separator may play at least a portion of the role in the high charge and discharge rates and low internal resistances of these supercapacitors. So first let's start with the big word, intercalation. What is intercalation and deintercalation? And what is lithiated carbon? Well, all of these are just very fancy ways of saying, and this may actually be easier to explain using an actual piece of graphite. So I'm gonna put this down. So here I have a sheet of solid graphite, and I think this should really, really make it easier to understand what I mean. So essentially, intercalation means that the lithium ions actually embed themselves in the structure of the activated carbon or graphite. Now, of course, this wouldn't be with a solid piece like this. It would be with a ground up powder where the lithium ions begin entering the structure or clinging to, I'm not quite sure, starting on the edges of the particles making up the powder. So actually I can draw that out. So I've drawn this based on information in the book on lithium ion supercapacitors, 
where they specifically specified that the graphite or activated carbon, I don't remember right now, I'll put it here which one it was, um, the graphite or activated carbon particles are potato shaped and that the lithium ions begin entering from the exterior of them. The lithium ions begin to enter the actual structure of the carbon, which if these were two-dimensional hexagons would sort of look like this. And that is called intercalation. The opposite of which is called deintercalation. So adding this onto the drawing I have here, that is actually what lithiated carbon means in this case. If you have a mass of carbon, activated carbon powder, which you have run an electrical current through with a lithium ion source to intercalate and thus turn into what is called lithiated carbon, it simply refers to a carbon powder or activated carbon mass essentially, which has had the lithium ions already intercalated into its structure. Now, I am not an expert on this, I am still learning, so if I am making a minor mistake here, please do correct me. But now that we have learned what the intercalation means, now we can get into the basic charge and discharge process that takes place in a lithium ion battery, which is very similar to that of these lithium ion capacitors, but which is not identical. And then we can get into the separator. So essentially in a lithium ion rechargeable battery, such as one of these 18650s, or one of those lithium polymers. And as you can see here, this would also be the case with a lithium iron phosphate. But essentially, you have a cathode or a positive where your active cathode material consists of a lithium metal oxide, which depending on the type of lithium battery could be lithium cobalt oxide. So the first one here, lithium iron phosphate, the second one, and lithium iron phosphate cells do tend to be of a lower nominal voltage or a lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide where the number of oxygens was not specified. So I'll just put an X. And then very similar to in the lithium ion supercapacitors, you have a ionic electrolyte solution, which is not water-based, which also contains a significant concentration of lithium ions. When charging the battery, the lithium ions from the cathode are carried by the electrolyte into the anode and are intercalated into the anode. Now, of course, there are several other chemical processes which take place in this. This is the overall reaction or chemical process behind the charge and discharge of a lithium ion battery, where during the charging process, your carbon anode is intercalated and essentially packed full of your lithium ions, where the lithium ions in the lithium battery are actually taken out from the cathode and inserted into the anode leaving behind your, in this case, cobalt oxide, which upon discharging is deintercalated out of the anode back into the cathode, where it recombines with your cobalt oxide again for this example. And this can also probably explain why you should not fully discharge a lithium battery to zero volts, because you never want this anode to be fully deintercalated from all of its lithium ions. So this drawing actually might not be a too bad of a way to explain how they work, but you may have noticed Another thing I put here right on the midpoint of the separator, and these are called dendrites. And this intercalation and deintercalation of the lithium ions is also why the separator must be an ionic separator. Meaning that in the case of most lithium batteries, you have a separator made of a very, very special type of polymer, which has been manufactured in a specific way to allow the passing of specific diameters of ions while blocking others. This prevents your anode and cathode from chemically reacting immediately and actually allows for your ions to be stored or rather be carried out from the cathode and packed into the anode when applying a voltage and applying a current and of course not accounting for the losses of efficiency which occur during discharge will return most of that electrical power back upon discharge where your lithium ions are taken out of the anode, carried by the electrolyte back into the cathode. And this is where this comes in, dendrites. And this is also where we get into the importance of the separator as far as the durability of lithium ion batteries go, or at least one aspect of the durability. And this is where I sort of came up with, and I guarantee I'm not the first one to come up with this analogy, but I came up with a screen door analogy, where if you imagine a screen door with the wind pressure or wind speed being analogous to your charge or discharge rate for a specific lithium cell, 
Well, you can imagine that there is only so much wind pressure you can put onto a specific surface area of screen door or like this, the screen material they put on the screen doors before it either pops out of the gasket or it just tears completely depending on how much pressure you're putting on it. And I think that analogy should carry over to this basic explanation of lithium ion chemistry. We're charging or discharging frequently at too high of a rate given the finite surface area of the separator, which would of course be like a three-dimensional sheet, results in the separator essentially becoming less and less effective as a separator. As the high charge and discharge rates exceeding that which the battery is designed to handle causes permanent damage to the separator, something which leads to higher self-discharge rates, higher internal resistance, and overall a decrease in the battery's life expectancy. Another thing which can happen if a battery is not kept healthy, however, this is something that also does happen over time. The formation of dendrites is a major part of research that is being currently done regarding lithium batteries in terms of how to reduce them as much as possible. And this is because, and I'm going to update my drawing here, and I didn't put these here right away so it's not confusing, but essentially what can happen is just like those things you see hanging from the roofs of caves in those pictures or whatever, I think they're called stalagmites. So a similar shape to those, Dendrites are basically physical structures, like these crystal structures which form, which if not kept under control, or if the battery is not designed to properly handle it, if it gets severe enough, can actually poke through the separator and cause a short in the battery, absolutely causing permanent damage to the battery cell. And while the formation of dendrites can be attributed to a wide range of factors, so again, after double checking right now, again, I am not a complete expert on this field, so I cannot say for sure what the leading cause of dendrites is. I did find a pretty interesting piece of information on a website called batterypoweronline.com. And the link to the article will be provided in the description. But essentially, and I am directly quoting from the website here. So lithium dendrites are metallic microstructures that form on the negative electrode during the charging process. Lithium dendrites are formed when extra lithium ions accumulate on the anode surface and cannot be absorbed into the anode in time. With the biggest hazard of dendrites being that they are metallic, so they can cause internal short circuits and are a major factor for the safety of lithium ion batteries. With one of the pretty interesting pieces of information on this website being that one of the main causes of the Galaxy Note 7 battery fires in 2016 after an investigation was that it was due to the mechanism behind the formation of lithium dendrites. So again, that was directly quoted from the website batterypoweronline.com. Link will be in the description. But also returning to the fact from the textbook where they tell us that the manufacturing process of these lithium supercapacitors of the EDLC type supercapacitors, where one or more of the electrode materials have been substituted for that of a identical or similar type that would be present in a lithium ion battery. Combined with the video on BigClive.com's channel where he took apart one of these, not exactly this type, but one of these lithium capacitors or lithium hybrid capacitors, because I believe he also came upon the same conclusion as I did, that these are not entirely capacitors in how they function, which is why he renamed the video to Capacitor Style, I believe. I'm going to double check on that. But essentially combining that information with another paragraph from the same article on the website Battery Power Online, where they begin explaining what causes the dendrite growth. And of course, they specify that it's due to a multitude of reasons. The first two reasons on their list is current density and temperature probably two of the most infamous battery killers or lithium ion battery killers, where they specify that a study on the main causes of dendrite growth and more specifically dendrite growth in relation to current density was studied at the Center of Life Cycle Engineering at the University of Maryland, where they had created a transparent optical cell, I am quoting directly from the website here, to observe the lithium dendrite growth process and address safety concerns. They then have a picture where they compare the dendrite growth versus the current density, which going back to my screen door analogy is basically how much current you're applying. Now this isn't really specific to the separator, but the separator would play a role in this, as would the surface areas of the anodes and cathodes, which then brings me to the supercapacitors and their internal construction. 
where basically the inside of a capacitor is sort of like one of those fruit by the foot rolls where you have a very, very, very long piece of separator with your two electrodes and typically the separator is like soaked in the electrolyte. And then you have your two aluminum electrodes in the case of the electrolytic capacitor on either side, which are then connected to the respective leads and encapsulated in this package designed to vent in a specific direction should there be a catastrophic failure. And while I believe that the 18650 batteries are manufactured in a similar fashion, as far as I can tell, the layers that they apply the materials on are much thinner on the capacitors than in the batteries. And if that is the case, then that would mean that you have a much lower current density over your two electrodes which then connecting that to what we just read on the website, Battery Power Online, where they conducted a study for dendrite growth versus current density, it would be quite easy to, well, not quite easy, but it could potentially, it leads me to make the, again, educated guess, I cannot know for sure, but make the educated guess that where potentially the higher surface area of the electrodes and separator, which would most likely be present in such capacitors, would lead to a decrease in current density, therefore allowing for the much, much higher relative charge and discharge rates per cell, something which we're going to get into in just a second, right after I open this capacitor up to show you what I mean, that the inside is made like a fruit by the foot roll. And yes, I should be wearing gloves for this, but I cannot find them. Okay, so I've got it open here. I'm going to try to not touch the inside as much as possible. But essentially, we can see the aluminum coating with the top being scored so that if it does blow open, it vents in the top. Okay, so I managed to just pull the cap off and this is where we can see the damp paper and where we can see it's sort of like the fruit by the foot roll I was talking about. So I managed not to touch the paper at all when taking this apart. However, because I do remember doing this many, many times when I was very young, it, I think it should be fine to do it in this video, but if you're watching this, do not repeat this at home. So this is a very damp paper. Again, I am cringing as I'm doing this because I know it is absolutely wrong, but I sort of have to prove my point here. So essentially, as you can see, it's like a paper that's mixed with a gummed adhesive type material. And as we unwrap this, we can see the alternating layers of aluminum with an aluminum oxide dielectric on it. And then we can see it transitioning to the bright unoxidized aluminum as we peel the layers off. So this is what I mean with the inside of the capacitor having a very high surface area. And that if the supercapacitors are made in the same way, this would really reduce the charge density. So you can see this is just a 470 microfarad um, electrolytic capacitor. And you can see the alternating layers. We have one and then two aluminum elect electrodes here both of which have been anodized to have a aluminum oxide dielectric. That is why you have this dull gray color. And then we have two layers of paper separator soaked in the electrolyte solution and also seems to be impregnated with some kind of gum adhesive. So this should be pretty cool for anyone who has not seen the inside of a supercapacitor, I mean, if I electrolytic capacitor. And you can see there's quite a few more wraps on there. So yeah, that's where it comes apart. But that's basically what the inside of an electrolytic capacitor looks like. And it should be what the inside of these capacitors also look like. But I am not going to open one of these up because I am not too certain on what's going to happen.
However, if someone like Big Clive is watching this, I would gladly send one of these over to have him open it up. So again, we can see the side with the paper peeled off. It has the bright aluminum, and the side with the aluminum exposed has the aluminum oxide anodized aluminum. So that's pretty neat and sort of serves to prove my point of what I was saying about how it's like a fruit by the foot roll. But now back to the main part of the video after I go and wash my hands very, very thoroughly. So after having washed my hands like five times in a row with hot water and scrubbing very, very thoroughly, we can now get into charge rate. So here I have three different types of lithium ion cells. The first one being a lithium polymer battery cell. The second two being the standard lithium ion 18650 and the baby version of that, the 14250, with these ones being 2.2 amp hours and this one being 400 milliamp hours. And then finally, I have four of the highest energy density lithium hybrid supercapacitors I could find. And this is where I will introduce everyone to the C rate or charge rate. It's a very simple concept. It might sound complicated, it's really not. So essentially taking one of these batteries, for example, this is a 2.2 amp hour 18650 battery. And I'm gonna zoom out here maybe a tiny bit just so I can put the text on screen. So before I can start to explain what makes these supercapacitors so special in terms of their super high charge and discharge rate, we first must understand the charge rate or C rating of a battery, something which sounds way more complicated than it should be. And basically all that means is that, let's say you have a 2.2 amp hour battery. So for simplicity, let's just say it's two amp hours. If you have a two amp hour battery and it has a C rating of one C, that means you cannot discharge or you should not discharge the battery at more than two amps of current, charge or discharge. It's that simple. So with this one, this lithium polymer is 2.4, 2.5 amp hours, two, two amp hours only. Yeah, I put my 2.5 amp hour one away. So with the two amp hour lithium polymer cell, this one specifically actually does have a 1C charge rating. So that means for optimal battery health, you should not discharge or charge this battery at more than 1C, which just basically means 2000 milliamps of current or two amps of current. It is really that simple. And in the case of the 400 milliamp hour battery, or actually it's 300 milliamp hours. I was misremembering that. So with this 14250, 300 milliamp hour battery, which is also rated for 1C, it should not be charged or discharged at more than 300 milliamps of current or 0 0.3 amps. Which brings us to this monster of an energy storage solution. So the manufacturer was actually kind enough to provide a milliamp hour equivalent rating because these do have very similar nominal voltages to that of a standard lithium battery. Of course, a lithium ion battery has a nominal voltage of 3.7 volts. However, the fully charged voltage of a lithium battery tends to be up to about 4.2 volts. So again, the manufacturer has provided a milliamp hour equivalent rating for each of these cells, which will make it very easy for us to determine the relative C rating of each of these cells. And will really put into contrast the discharge and charge rates of these batteries. So starting off with this little 200 farad 4 volt, and I know I said little, this is far from being little, but starting off with this 200 farad 4 volt supercapacitor, and actually this one is not specified in the data sheet, so I'm just gonna step up to the 500 one. So with this 500 farad 4.0 volt supercapacitor, we have a milliamp hour equivalent rating of 200 milliamp hours with a operating rated current of four amps per cell for the 500 farad four volt. And we can find that charge rate by just dividing the four amps by 0 0.2 amps, so 200 milliamps which gives us a C rating given the rated current of this of 20 C, which means you can charge or discharge this at 20 times its equivalent capacity in terms of the amount of current you're pulling or putting into it. And that's only the recommended operating current. The maximum current for this 500 farad four volt capacitor is an absolutely insane 28 amps per cell. So just dividing that 
28 divided by 0.2 amps. That gives us a C rating of 140 C. That is very, very crazy. So next, moving up to the 750 farad 3.8 volt cell. These are of the LIC type, as the product code says. So they do have a lower current density than the 1100 farad ones, where we actually cross over into kilofarad territory. But with the 750 farad 3.8 volt cells, they have a milliamp hour equivalent rating of 300 milliamp hours with a much lower rated current for operating of three amps. So dividing three amps by 0 0.3 amps gives us only about 10 C. And I know I say only about, that is pretty good, but there's gonna be a massive difference once we step up to this one. So this 1.1 kilofarad four volt supercapacitor has a milliamp hour equivalent rating of 450 milliamp hours with a recommended rated current of six amps and a maximum current of 40 amps with a mass of only about 21 grams, which is basically the same as the capacitor in Tom Stanton's video, which was only 100 farads, 3.0 volts. So this is where I begin to suspect that the types of capacitors that are of the lower energy density may be what the book was referring to as second generation, and that these ones may be third generation. Again, I am not an expert on this subject, at least not yet, so I cannot say for certainty if that is the case, but that would be my educated guess. So back to what the C rating would be for this. This is a 450 milliamp hour equivalent supercapacitor with a recommended current discharge rating of six amps. So dividing six by 0 0.45 amps gives us a C rating of 13.3 C, so three C above this one, but then the maximum current rating, which is a whopping 40 amps, gives us a C rating of 88.8 .8 C for this tiny little cell. And I know I say tiny, but that amount of current, 40 amps from something this small, just putting that beside an 18650, that is mind blowing. And is one of the reasons I got the thermal camera because I really wanna see how this behaves thermally under a very high discharge rate. It is also the reason why I have the discharge tester you may have been seeing in the background of the videos. That was actually a little hint from the beginning of the channel that I will be doing supercapacitor stuff, which we have finally gotten to now. So this is where I'm going to end this part one of this series because this is gonna be, supercapacitors are going to be a major part of this channel moving forward. And this has been the plan since the beginning. The original name for this channel was going to be the Supercapacitor channel, but I wanted to put more of a personal flair to it, so I did put my name, so I put it as Keon's Lab. But the actual name for this channel was supposed to be the Supercapacitor channel, since I actually bought over a hundred of these about one and a half years ago. And if you don't believe me, I'll show you. So here is one tray. I'm not using the same ones. I actually have a massive box here. Second tray. And third tray. And then we have the fourth one which I've used quite a bit of because I've been making, well, I'm not gonna say it yet. If you wanna see, you have to subscribe, but I've been making something pretty cool with these over the past year or so. And you may have noticed this in the background. This is a 300 something watts. I'm gonna put it here. It's over 300 watts. It's rated for a massive amount of current that way exceeds the current rating of this 10 amp power supply. Making this jet fan one of the optimal candidates to demonstrate the strong suits of these new devices because it is a massive high drain device that in the application of a hand dryer, for example, would not need to run for that long before you can go back into your charge cycle for the supercapacitors. So if you like this video, please remember to like the video and subscribe because I put a lot of work into this. This is probably one of the biggest videos I've made so far. I had to do several takes, wrote several iterations of the script, by far the most complicated video I've had to make so far. So if you did like this, even a tiny bit, make sure to like. And if you do want to see what I've been up to with these, 
over the past year, then do really make sure to subscribe to the channel since I believe a lot of people will find what I'll be doing here very, very cool. Thank you for watching this video on Keon's Lab and I'll see you in the next one.